remember it, it's either or, really simple. You have to stand for one, sit for the other. Very easy game. So the first option is ice cream in winter. The other option is ice cream only in summer. That's a very weird. So ice cream all year long, or ice cream is just for summer. So stand in for ice cream all year long, and sit in for ice cream is only summer. Hey, hey, look at that. Oh, wow, like my husband would be so impressed with you. He's like, this is, these are his people. These are ice cream people. Excellent, thank you. I'm gonna tell him this. We should have got a picture of everyone standing so I could show him. Okay, so the next question, who likes chocolate milk? I have a chocolate milk question. Good, excellent. Now, it's very technical. When you make your chocolate milk, do you put in milk first or powder first? This is the question. So I guess I'm resolving some sort of internal argument, I think. So I apologize to the deans who have to live with the fallout of this. Yep, good, we're holding it down. So. If you make your chocolate milk with milk first, stand up. And if you make it with powder first, <laughs> sit down. Okay. I, oh dear. <laughs> all right, they're all wrong, okay. <laughs> oh dear. I'm guessing that the only way to truly resolve this discussion is a taste test. So I vote that one evening after this, we're all gonna have some chocolate milk, half made milk first and half made chocolate first, and we're gonna see who wins. That's, that's what I'm saying. And I have to try it, I think. I think I should be the judge. I think that works, right? I get to judge the chocolate milk. I think it's like my thing, yeah. Chocolate, it's my thing. Okay, so I have in my hand some dice and I need a willing volunteer and probably a microphone. Uh, can I pick this one up? Am I allowed to pick this up? Is this okay? Good, all right. So I have a dice and all I need you to do is pick out the dice, tell me what it says and then tell everybody a day when you had the thing that's on the dice. It's really simple. It's really easy. I promise. Let's practice. Should we practice? We should have a practice run. Okay. I'm gonna come. Look at everyone's hiding. You were like, oh my gosh, it's gonna speak to me. Yeah, I did tell you I'm here to get to know you, right? I said that? So you need to get over this one, right? Okay, help me because everybody's really scared. So pick out a dice for me, please. Okay, right. The first, in, first one you look at, tell everybody what it is. <laughs> in a polite language. Go on. Is it, is it what I think it is? Okay, excellent. So, you go on. <laughs> it, the, the dice have pictures on. Ones that you will be familiar with. And when she says this, you're gonna understand why she feels like, oh, how did I pick this dice? So she picked? Poop. Poop. And so I'm guessing that everybody in here has had a day that felt like poop once. Yeah, yeah? Everybody had one of those days where it just didn't feel great? Yeah? Okay. I'll let you off the hook. I won't do any more. All right, let's try again. I'll take poop out of the equation. So, my hand's coming over here. Young man. Pick out a dice. It, they don't bite, honestly. I... <laughs> Do you have one? Excellent. What's the first thing you see? Smile. Smiley. When was the last time you smiled? Friday? Friday, awesome. It was a while ago, but that's okay. We like you still. 
<laughs> okay, let's see. One more go. Don't worry, we have some... Yeah? Yes? Excellent. Volunteers. Mm. Let's come here. Help out the young people who are feeling so embarrassed by me. I don't know why. Let's see. Which one did you get? Um, I have no idea what that is. I can't even help you. Mm. Oh, shaking hands. Shaking hands? Yeah. When's the last time you like met someone new or something? Oh, today. Today? Yes. Was that me? No. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. See, I, I don't bite, honest. You guys get so scared. So silly. Right. Well, today we are looking at emotions in our talk. And that's why I have my little dice. So, two things. One, if you have a question you would like me to do, then please feel free to pop along and I'll write it down and I'll do that. Um, if it's going to start a whole war, uh, then hey, so be it. The deans are here to help me out. But we are going to play the dice game a bit more in some other forms. Okay, so let's just tell a story. Today we are telling the story of David. Now, Everybody knows the story of David. It's a very simple story. David was a small guy. People know some small guys. They're not so tall, small. It's a short guy, but he was cute. So it was okay. To be small and cute is not such a bad thing. He was cute as button. People liked him. He did really well in his family business. He did. It was a family business and he did really well in it. Yeah, so he was doing quite well. He was a good musician. Isn't that helpful? We have musicians here, right? I've seen a few circulating around here. So being a musician is really cool. So he played the harp. Well, a little bit different to playing a piano, but that's okay. So he played the harp, beautiful instrument, and he would go places and play the harp for people. And his life was going okay. He even gets told that he's going to get a great job when he graduates to being an adult. So his life is on track to do really well. In fact, life is going so well that he takes down a giant. So, hey, what more do you need? If you're taking down giants, life is going good. And one day, while everything is going really well, he sits in the court's palace. So he's in a palace and he's playing the harp for the king and everything feels real good and sweet until there is an arrow flying at his head. And he has to run for his life because the most powerful man in the entire kingdom has decided that David is the enemy. And this becomes one of the most famous cases of bullying in the Bible. Because in essence, this is what King Saul does to David. He has all the power. He has armies at his disposal. He has people everywhere. And he bullies a child, a young man. And he decides that this young man is so threatening that he can chase him wherever he goes and he's spreading lies about him and he's talking bad about him and he is trying to kill him at every opportunity. He's killing his character. He's trying to kill him physically and David is under pressure. He is the bullied leader. Sometimes when we talk about David, we talk about King David, but actually we forget that there were decades decades, not just one year, but tens of years, where David was on the run, where he feared for his life. There were times when he didn't have anywhere to sleep because it wasn't safe. And so he would sleep in caves. He was bullied in the worst way imaginable because the most powerful person decided he was the enemy. Now, we can think of times in our lifetime when we have seen people be bullied. Recently, we've seen Donald Trump decide that he's going to take set on certain young Americans that stand out against him. 
and he talks badly and he puts it all over Twitter. And in essence, he bullies them out of their job. Colin Kaepernick being the most famous example of that. But bullying is a real problem in today's society because we wield a different kind of power. But I wondered to myself, how could I explain to you what it feels like to be bullied? And so I had to go to a time when I was 15 years old, a little bit younger than most of you in the room. Um, life was okay. Life was okay. I mean, it was hard, but it wasn't, it's not David good, but it was okay. You know, I went to school, I had my best friend I would walk to school with, five kilometers to school, five kilometers back, and we would walk and talk. Sometimes we would just read. Does anyone, do you guys still do that? Like read and walk at the same time and be like, car, you know, that type of thing. You know, we would do that every day. For five days a week, I would see her, I would hang out with her, it would be brilliant. And then on the weekend, I would go to church, and I wasn't a popular girl by any stretch of the imagination, but I did okay for myself. I was all right. I had my little group of friends. We were the Fab Four. We did okay. You know, we, we, we used to like coordinate an outfit now and then and have a little bit of fun when we went to youth rally days and such fun activities. And then one day, I got to church and something was different. No one would speak to me. I had no idea what was happening. I said, I ran up to my friends, I was like, hey, and then they just turned and walked away. And I was left feeling really confused because I didn't know what was happening. And this continued all day. Nobody was speaking to me. I could hear whispers. I could hear people talking. And I was just confused and hurt. And in the end, I just left and went home. And then the next week, I walked to school with my friends and I explained to her what had happened that weekend because she wasn't a Christian and I was. And I didn't want to say anything bad about people, but I was like, I'm hurting. These are so-called Christian people who are supposed to be my best friends. And they just turned their back and started talking about me because I knew they were talking about me because every time they said something, they'd look, they'd point and they'd tell somebody else. And this went on for weeks. My mum would make me go to church because at this point I didn't want to go anymore. My friends had completely cut me off. The adults were behaving really rude towards me. Everybody had started to act like I had some kind of disease that was contagious. And I was feeling overwhelmed. And I did not want to go anywhere. I was hurting in the worst possible way. And when I finally, my mother and I had a conversation and it went something to the effect of, well, you're gonna be 16. If you don't wanna go, you don't have to go. And I went and I was so upset by the whole thing that I went and stayed with my grandmother because I couldn't even be in the same area because it felt like everywhere I went, I could hear people talking about me. And so I went to go and stay with my grandmother that summer. And I stayed there for a number of weeks. And then when I came back home to my mother's house, I said, okay, God, we are cool. Like, I'm okay with you, but your people, they suck. I don't like them. They have been nothing but mean towards me. And I don't know why. Everywhere I go, people are judging me. And I just, I don't want that. I don't like those kind of people. And I was really hurt. And I just said, okay, look, this is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to go find some other church to go to and I'll sit in the back and I'll just do that. And then I'll just leave so I never have to speak to anybody. And I spoke to my husband last night because I said, I don't know that I really want to tell the young people this story because it's not particularly nice. I'm not proud of all that <laughs> happened at that time. I'm also adult enough to know that it's, bullying is not easy to live through. I hated myself. I hated those girls. I hated so many people at that time because I was so hurt by their behavior. 
Now, we didn't have Twitter back then, so nobody was stalking me. Nobody was kind of running it all through the entire world. So I guess in some ways, small mercies. But it didn't change the fact that it hurt in my soul. And then one day, it was getting near Christmas, nearly a year and a half later, and one of the Fab Four gave me a call. And I was like, okay, what, what do you want? Like, it's been a year and a half. By now, I'd heard what they had spread about me. I'd heard the reason why I was the enemy. Because everyone began to say, oh, she's easy. She sleeps with loads of guys. She's loose. She's a floozy. They used more rude words, actually. I'm trying to be polite Christian here. <laughs> trying to keep it pastoral. But they called me names that should not be recorded and live streamed. Um, and they were saying that basically I was sleeping around with loads of people. And at that point, to be honest, uh, A, I wasn't. And B, I didn't even like boys, to be fair. You guys were kind of like, ugh, to me at that point. I was not interested at all. So I was just devastated. And then came the news when the rumor hit me that somebody decided to use my family against me. So my mum is a single parent. And we grew up in inner city London in a poor neighborhood. They are rich by any stretch of the imagination. And so basically they said, you are going to be no better than your mother. You're going to end up pregnant, living in a council house, which is like assisted housing. I don't know what you have in Norway, but it's like not a great place to live. And you're going to be like sleeping with men for money. And that's what was said about me at 15. By adults, by the way, not by the young people. By now it had grown to like a whole load of people talking about me. So you can imagine when that call came through from this girl, I was like, are you seriously calling me? Like, what could you possibly have to say to me a year and a half after you ruined my life? You told everybody something. And now you want to talk to me about what exactly? What could you possibly say? And she said, could you come for Christmas dinner with the family? I have to be honest with you, I was like, is this girl crazy? Like, I had to go to my mom, I was in floods of tears. I was like, I am just getting over the pain of all that was done to me. And this girl wants me to come to her house for Christmas dinner, not saying a word. Has she lost her mind? My mom was like, well, you know, it's the nice thing to do. I was like, nice, I don't care about nice. These people hurt me. I don't want to go. And so I decided, after much pressure from my mother, being the obedient child that I was, that I was going to turn up because her family extended grandparents. That family hadn't done anything to me. And if they had invited me, then I should go. And so I went in and I gave my greetings to the grandparents and I spoke to them. And then I took my plate of food as when food was served and I sat in the corner and I just hoped it would be over quickly. I just prayed, please let this meal be over quickly so I can go home and I won't break down. I won't cry here. I don't want this to be the place where everyone sees me break. And so I just ate my food really quietly. And my friend came up to me, she's like, hey! And I was like, uh, no. Hi. Can we talk? I was like, really? A year and a half later? Now you know my name and want to talk to me? I'm not really interested. Okay, sure. And I sat down. And she said, I have an apology to make to you. And I was like, pardon? She said, what we did was wrong. I was like, excuse me? And then this is what happened. The Fab Four were amazing, but we were not allowed to date until we were 18. 
None of us. All of the parents had conspired and said we weren't dating till we were 18. We're from a really traditional conservative place. But one of us had a boyfriend. So all of us were keeping the secret that one of us had a boyfriend. But this boyfriend wasn't a nice boyfriend. This boyfriend, <laughs> he had decided that one day he had seen me walk in with my friend to school. And I had said hello, because that's what you do if you see someone you know, right? You say hello. And he had managed to turn that into I had propositioned him for sex. So he went back and told his girlfriend, my friend, hey, you can't trust Tabitha, because she tried to get me to sleep with her. What? Me? Try to do what? With who? Ugh. No, not my type. He was really, mm -mm, not for me. Not only are you saying that my best friend in the whole world, I would do that to her. I mean, forget you, but like her. But the real kicker is as my friend explained to me what had happened, she said, we didn't care, we believed her. We believed him. He told us what we wanted to hear. He told us a way to get rid of you. We always thought that you were really popular and we didn't like that. So we wanted to get rid of you. Now remember, I told you I wasn't very popular. So I don't know what they had created in their heads. But girls at that age, apparently, my mother tells me, can be really mean. At least that was my experience. And I learned a really hard lesson that day. Forgiveness sets everybody free. I was so angry and so filled with rage and hate for so long that I was tied to these girls and all of that pain, I couldn't move on until the day that that young lady said, what we did was wrong. We knew you didn't do it. Of course we did. We found out later that what had happened was he was seeing someone else and he thought I caught him. I was an oblivious 15 year old. I really wasn't looking at him for that. I just said hello and kept walking. So he thought, get her before she gets me. He managed to ruin nearly two years of my life because he thought, get her before she gets me. That's what bullying does. For David, it took nearly 30 years for him to get over what had happened with Saul. David was a big character. He kept faithful the whole time. He had opportunities to get back at the person who was creating evil for him, and he never did. I can't claim to be such a big character. I know that I was hurt, and that I was angry, and that it took all of my strength to go and sit at that Christmas dinner table with all of these people, knowing that they felt some way about me, not knowing how badly until my friend says, I'm sorry. But we are quite a distance from my 15-year-old self and quite away from that time. And we're all now getting along very well. It's taken some time for us to put trust back in the relationship. But it is interesting that when we think of leaders, we always think of the shiny face, the kind of great king, the pastor who comes to Norway and does the sermon. Look, she's a leader. We don't think of the hard times that they face during the leadership. We don't think of what shaped their character to be who they are. And so for you as young people, you begin in your journey to be leaders. You are beginning the journey to helping another person. It is my hope, it is my prayer that you will learn from the mistakes of others. You won't be a bully because I'm sure you're not those kinds of people. But if you experience bullying, if you experience the pain that comes with that, if you experience the hurt that comes with that, that you will get help 
that you will find a way to find peace and forgiveness because your story is so much bigger than that moment of bullying that is happening right then and there. I can look back now and say that two years did not destroy me, it made me stronger. But at the time, I felt like I lost two years of my life, was gone because of the evil of others. But I stand stronger today because I got help eventually. I learned to forgive. I learned to accept apologies. Not an easy thing to do when someone says they're sorry to say I accept that. So I hope my prayer is for you that as you negotiate the world, you will meet people who aren't nice. And I pastor two churches now, so I'm obviously not anti-church. Some church people are human, they make mistakes, they do horrible things, they have to apologize, that's life. But as you negotiate the world, as you meet people, and people begin to behave in ways that are not nice, because I cannot promise you roses, that you will find ways of being a bigger and a better person. That you will do like David, and not kill your enemy, but love your enemy. That you won't take the opportunity to take the spear and drive it back at him, but you will give him the opportunity to live and to learn from their mistakes. Let us pray. Father God, we have spent some time talking about one of your beloved leaders, but talking about a side of his leadership that we don't often speak about. We don't often speak about bullying. We don't often speak about the way that our words and our actions impact on others. We don't always speak about how harmful that is to somebody's soul. We don't often give voice to that. So Lord, I ask that if there is someone here who is struggling with this issue, or that this comes to their door, that you will give them strength to find help, that you will give them strength to overcome the situation, that you will give them the strength to find your loving voice so that they can give the opportunity to love someone else. Not by going and interfering in the situation, but by allowing you to do that work. Not by taking vengeance for themselves. So Lord, I ask that as we continue to go through this week that you help us to be stronger. Help us to learn about you and help us to be better than we were the day before. In Jesus' name, amen.